Hello everybody! Now, those under the age of 15 aren't gonna know what this is, but this is the first Core 2 Duo. It's the E6700, and it actually paved the way for Intel's modern multi-core CPUs as we know them. It came out 17 years ago with a mid-range processor, but a lot has changed since then. So, we're gonna take a look at how it holds up in a modern environment with modern games and find out what exactly made this processor so good. So, it's 2005, and the first dual-core chips are hitting the market with Intel's Pentium Ds and AMD's Athlon X2 series. At the time, Intel was using their problematic netburst architecture and knew they needed a complete redesign if they wanted to stay competitive. So they came out with the Core 2 Duo series as a part of the brand new Core microarchitecture in the Conroe family. It was nothing short of amazing, and part of their success comes from a thing called Wide Dynamic Execution and Macro Fusion. Wide Dynamic Execution basically allows the processor to work on multiple instructions in parallel rather than sequentially. So first the CPU fetches the instruction, and then they decode it into micro operations called UOPs. Then using out of order execution, it rearranges the order of UOPs based on processing availability and dependencies. Then, MacroFusion combines pairs of these instructions into a single UOP, meaning these chips were able to process more instructions per clock cycle than ever before. They also shorten the pipeline to 14 stages down from NetBurst 31. Having a longer pipeline can actually be beneficial and can allow for higher clock speeds, and in the early 2000s, everyone was trying to clock their chips as fast as possible. However, a longer pipeline also increases the penalty of mispredicted branches, which forces the CPU to discard its predictions and flush the pipeline. Having a shorter pipeline meant that less predicted processing stages were lost and the CPU could recover much quicker. But arguably, the most important change was to the advanced smart cache. What made it advanced was its ability to dynamically allocate cache space for both of the cores using an arbitration bus. Intel's previous NetBurst chips had two independent caches connected via the system bus and this caused a lot of latency, and each NetBurst core needed to store its own data even if it was identical to that of the other core. Luckily, Conroe fixed this issue with this new cache designed specifically for multi-core chips. So what did our chip actually come with? Well, the Core 2 Duo E6700 obviously had two cores and also two threads with a 65 watt TDP, a clock speed of 2.66 gigahertz and four megabytes of L2 cache. It also doesn't have integrated graphics, it doesn't have support for hyper-threading, and doesn't support the SSE4 instruction set which can cause issues in modern games. Now I bought this CPU for $15 on eBay and threw it into an Inspiron 530 with eight gigabytes of DDR2 memory, Windows 7, a 70 200 RPM hard drive and an RTX 3060. Generally, a 15 year old age gap of any kind is a red flag, but I wanted to make sure that the E6700 was not going to be bottlenecked by the GPU. In fact, I considered building an entire high end LGA775 setup just to make sure this processor was running as fast as possible. But that's really expensive, so I didn't. So consider leaving a like, subscribing, or commenting because every interaction helps and I need money to buy old PC parts. So, how does it hold up 17 years later? Well, I booted up the PC and it began to scream at me, which turned out to be an issue with the RAM, so I spent a half hour rearranging sticks only for the original config to be the only one that worked. Then I had to learn the ancient technology of burning CDs and installed Windows 7. Eventually I got into Windows, but Steam refused to work, I was missing DLL so I couldn't launch games transferred via a USB, and I couldn't install display drivers for the 3060 or an HD 7950. I reinstalled the entire OS from a brand new ISO, but this didn't fix the issue, and long story short, we ended up using Tiny 10, which is a lightweight version of Windows 10. Now, the e 6700 was designed for Windows XP, not 7 or 8, and here we are running Tiny 10. To be fair, at idle, Windows 7 and Tiny 10 both use about 5% of the CPU, so it shouldn't be bogged down too much by the operating system, but that's a topic for another video. Either way, it was time to see how it held up. General system usage was somehow actually fine. It wasn't flawless by any means, but was surprisingly usable. Sometimes there was a bit of delay between clicking on things and them actually happening, and it wasn't a particularly fast experience, but it wasn't horrible, and you could daily drive it for very simple tasks. The first actual test was of Cinebench, sort of just to make sure it was getting enough cooling and was on par with other systems. It got a score of 123 CB, which seemed roughly on par with other tests, so its performance is generally normal. Also, how the heck did this guy get his running at 5.5 gigahertz? That's insane and I want to do that. Now, the first game we ran was GTA 5 and 1080p with the low settings. It got an average of 23 FPS with a minimum 1% and 0.1% lows of 3 FPS. Obviously, it wasn't great and it wasn't really playable. You're not supposed to run anything even remotely modern on such an old processor and expect it to be halfway decent. Compared to any low-end modern CPU, this thing is a piece of sh** and I just wanted to see if it could be used to do anything 17 years later. Battlebit, however, actually ran fine. 
This game is a low-end gamer's dream. It's fun, popular, and you can run it on basically anything. With the lowest settings in 1080p, we got an average of 46 FPS with a minimum of 11, 1% lows of 15, and 0.1% lows also of 11. I wasn't really expecting this. I figured the game might get like 30 max, but it was playable and plausibly competitive. Now at this point, I still had some delusions of grandeur of this CPU getting at least 5 FPS in Cyberpunk, but BeamNG Drive helped me realize that that wasn't going to happen in my wildest dreams. In 1080p with a low setting, got an average of 12, a minimum of 4, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 6. You can't really play it, but this is not an easy game to run, and at least it's spinning out a few frames. Now, for the reasonable people out there, we did play a few older Valve games. CSGO was the first up with the lowest settings in 1080p and got an average of 36 FPS with a minimum of 13, 1% lows of 17, and 0.1% lows of 14. This one went worse than I expected. You can run CSGO on basically anything, but apparently not a Core 2 Duo E6700 using Tiny10. Left Dead 2 was also kind of a letdown. I couldn't get the overlay to work, but in 1080p with the low settings got maybe about 25 to 35 FPS. There was some hitching, it wasn't the most stable experience, but it was playable enough. The game only froze once during the 5 minutes I played it for and fixed itself relatively quickly, so by my standards that's good enough to play. Last but not least, we also have Portal 2. This one was flawless. In 1080p with the low settings got an average of 85 FPS with a minimum of 23, 1% lows of 38, and 0.1% lows of 27. Given the CPU's performance in other games, this was actually better than I expected, and it turns out if you play age-appropriate games on your computer, it'll probably run well. So in conclusion, it's not great. It hasn't held up too well, actually. Sure, it was a really good CPU upon release, but 17-year-old hardware isn't going to hold up well in a modern environment. Also, the hard drive in this thing sucked. This definitely impacts performance. I'd be idling and CPU would be at like 10%, and the drive would spike from 20 to 80 to 40. It was all over the place. I let the system system idle for like two hours and then restarted it before testing, so all background updates should have finished up, but I hate hard drives. Also when making this script, I realized halfway through that I actually had the Pentium E6700, not the Core 2 Duo E6700. That's a stupid fucking naming scheme. They're two entirely different processors. The Pentium came out in 08 as an entry level option and is clocked higher with a smaller L2 cache. A few more things I want to mention. This website says that the Core 2 Duo E6300 was the first Core 2 Duo released. On July 27th, but I'm 99% sure that that was the release date of the full initial Core 2 Duo lineup. I don't know, man. I was like four at the time. I still ended up impulse buying one in the original box, but I don't know what to do with it, so let me know if you have any ideas. Also, did you know that most DVDs only go up to 4.7 gigabytes? Like, how the f did people get anything done in the early 2000s? That's crazy. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. Consider leaving a like or subscribing because it genuinely helps me out. If you want to join the community, there's a link to the official Jangdai Discord server in the description, and if you want to check out Jangdai, Com, that helped the channel out. If you have any questions or related comments, then leave them below and I'll be sure to respond to them. That's about it. Have a great day. Bye.